Maybe you've noticed that sometimes people will tell you that a speaker needs no introduction and then they proceed to give one anyway. I'm not going to do that this morning. Instead, I'm going to give a word of public gratitude in which I address uh, Dr. Piper with personal thanks. Dr. Piper, thank you for coming to Wheaton College when I was a student and speaking in chapel on Jonathan Edwards, fueling my desire to be a scholar pastor. I still have the notes. Thank you for your masterful dissertation on Romans 11, which taught me so much about the mercy and the sovereignty of God. Thank you for your example of faithful gospel ministry at Bethlehem Baptist Church, 32 years and counting. Thank you for writing the books that have helped me and so many others, including I'm sure many of our students, not to waste our lives, to desire God, to honor the supremacy of Christ in preaching, and to seek the gladness of the nations in the worship of God. Thank you for treating me like a brother and colleague and encouraging me at one point to be open to God's possible calling to come back to Wheaton College. And thank you for coming to Wheaton College this morning and tonight to help us live out the implications of the cross in relationships that cross racial and ethnic boundaries. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, I ask that there would come into this room now a peace that passes all understanding because it's been bought by the blood of Jesus and will be applied by the Holy Spirit and will pull the plug on anger that so often lies just beneath the surface when racial diversity and racial harmony are addressed. So give a sweetness to the spirit of these students, I pray, that corresponds to how wonderfully they have been purchased by Jesus for yourself forever. So come, remove every obstacle to understanding and grant that I would be able to be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. When I came here in 1964, um, interracial marriage was against the law in 16. When I was a senior, the Supreme Court struck down all of those laws in a decision called Loving versus Virginia. And from a historical perspective, as you can see, that was not very long ago. And when laws are struck down which had deep feelings behind them, feelings don't change at the same pace that laws do. So my aim in this message is to argue from Scripture and from experience that interracial marriage is not only permitted in the Bible among God's people, but is to be celebrated as a positive good and as a beautiful thing. It is not only to be tolerated, but celebrated. And not everybody believes that. For example, many African American leaders would disagree. They would say, interracial, it's a quote from Lawrence Graham, interracial marriage undermines African American ability to introduce our children to black role models who accept their racial identity with pride. Um, white conservative columnist named H. Millard has exactly the opposite vision for the same horrible result, namely it's, it must be a genocidal conspiracy we are seeing the death of the American and his replacement with non-European types who now have enough mass in our society to pervert European ways. White people are going to have to struggle mightily to survive the neo-melting pot and avoid being part of a one-size-fits-all human model. Call it what it is, genocide and extinction of the white genotype. And then I got a letter from a, a white Christian man not long ago who said this, as individuals, they are precious souls for whom Christ died and whom we are to love and seek to win. As a race, however, they are unique and different and have their own culture 
I would never marry a black. Why? Because I believe God made the races, separated them, and set bounds for their habitations. Deuteronomy 32, 8, Acts 17, 26. He made them uniquely different and intended that these distinctions remain. God never intended the human race to become a mixed or mongrel race. So while I am strongly opposed to segregation, I favor separation that the uniqueness with which God made them is maintained. And to those views, I would add my own experience. Uh, by almost any definition, I was a racist growing up in Greenville, South Carolina. And since I am a sinner still, I have little doubt that remnants of that remain in me. That's why I approved, Danny, so strongly of your article that I read from the record last spring about this is not a once-for-all issue. Like, I took care of this five years ago. You know, I had a real good experience and did some reconciliation, and now I'm fine. You're not fine, and I'm not fine. Nobody's fine. We are sinners in need of repenting every day because of this and a hundred other sins that are never, never leaving us alone. My definition of racism is the beliefs and the practices that come from valuing one race over another. And by that and other definitions, I was one of those. My attitudes were deplorable, demeaning, disrespectful towards non-whites as a teenager. And right at the heart of that attitude was an opposition to interracial marriage. My mother washed my mouth out with soap one time, literally. It was ivory soap, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Because I said, shut up, to my sister. <laughs> if she had known what I said racially, when she wasn't around, she would have washed my mouth out with gasoline. She was, in more ways than one, the means of my salvation. When I was 17, 1963, just before I came here, our church voted to prohibit blacks from coming into the sanctuary because they argued, well, the only reason they'd come is political, and so that's a bad motive, and so they should be prohibited from coming. My mother, at my sister's wedding in December of 1963, marched all her black friends right into the sanctuary and sat them down. So you can see where the seeds of some measure of redemption in my life were coming from. I don't blame my parents for any of my sins, none of them. And you shouldn't either. 1967, Urbana. So here I am, I'm a senior now, sitting where you sit. And Noel and I met Noel here, loved Noel, married Noel, 44 years later, good deal. I'm really happy that happened. <laughs> we went together to Urbana, and there uh, something happened that was most remarkable in this regard. Warren Webster, former missionary to Pakistan, was on a panel, was asked by a student in front of 9,000 people, what, what, if, what if your daughter fell in love with a Pakistani? and wanted to marry him while you're over there being a missionary, what would you do? And he said, more or less, wish I could remember his exact words, but this is very close, better a Christian Pakistani than a rich, white, American, godless man. That landed on me with unbelievable force in 1967. It was another one of those steps in my ongoing walk out of racism. So what I want to do in the minutes that we have remaining is give you four insights from the Bible and then close with some applications to our experience. So here we go. Number one, all races have one ancestor in the image of God and therefore all human beings descending from Adam because of the way Genesis talks about it, are in the image of God. And that truth about your identity compared to any racial identity you have is a million to one.
God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then Paul, standing in Athens, among a people who prided themselves as being intrinsically above the barbarian and the Scythian, said these explosive words. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. So he's saying to these Greeks, you are related to those folks you know. You do all have the same father. And when you put that together with Genesis 127, every single person on the planet is not only related to you by having the same father and mother, but also are in the image of the immortal God, and therefore you have never met a human being who is not a wonder. And they are to be treated accordingly. That's number one. Number two, the Bible forbids intermarriage between believers and unbelievers, clearly, but not between races. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, a wife should be bound, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whomever she wishes only in the Lord. Whomever she wishes, only in the Lord. So there's this one biblical restriction put upon whom you marry, namely, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you marry a believer in Jesus Christ. And when the, when the Old Testament forbade intermarrying with the nations, it wasn't because of cultural and racial preservation. It was because of religious preservation. Let me read it to you. This is Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. You shall not intermarry with the nations. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. The issue is not color mixing or custom mixing or clan identity. The issue is, will there be one common allegiance to the true God in this marriage? And that's what you should care about more than anything. Will there be one common allegiance to the King of Kings in this marriage? And the prohibition of God's Word against interracial or interethnic marriage there was not to preserve ethnic identity, but to preserve faith. And therefore, the transfer over is, let the true Israel of God marry the true Israel of God made up from people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Did you get that? That's number two. Number three, in Christ, our oneness is profound and transforms racial and social differences from barriers to blessings. In Christ, our oneness is profound, beyond words profound, and transforms social differences from barriers to blessings. Colossians 3, 9 to 11. You have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Christ is all and in all. Now, that does not mean that every minority culture gets swallowed up by the majority culture in the church. God doesn't obliterate all ethnic and cultural differences. He redeems them. He refines them. He purifies them. He enriches them in the togetherness of the kingdom. So the final image that we get in the book of Revelation of the kingdom is he redeemed a people for himself from every people and tribe and tongue and nation. All of those trying to stretch out to the magnificent countless diversities 
of the peoples and has made them a kingdom and priest to our God. So they are the peoples and they are a kingdom and they are a priesthood to God and the distinctions are not obliterated in the kingdom any more than they are in the church. So the point of verse 11 of Colossians 3, not Greek, not Jew, not barbarian, not Scythian, is not that there are no cultural, racial, ethnic differences or that they're of no significance, but that they are no hindrance to deep, profound, intimate fellowship and unity in the people of God, including the family of God, including marriage. Number four, criticizing one interracial marriage was severely disciplined by God in the Bible. There was, there was an interracial marriage that was criticized, and God got very angry, not at the marriage, but at the criticism, namely Moses' marriage to a Cushite woman. So Moses is a Jew, and he marries a black African. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he married a Cushite woman. Now, Cushite and Ethiopian in Hebrew are virtually interchangeable. It's a, Cush was a land just south of what we know as Ethiopia, and they're all black-skinned, very black-skinned, in fact, historically and to this day. And we know this biblically because of Jeremiah 13, 23, where it says, can an Ethiopian, now that's the same word for Cushite in Hebrew as you have in Numbers 12, 1. So you get a, a Cushite, this woman who, whom Moses married. Can a, can a Cushite change his skin or a leopard his spots? So clearly Cushite signified somebody with a dark skin. Daniel Hayes in his book, uh, A Biblical Theology of Race, 2003 with University, page 71, here's what he says. Is, Cush is used regularly to refer to the area south of Egypt and above the cataracts on the Nile where a black African civilization flourished for over 2,000 years. Thus, it is quite clear that Moses married a black African woman. Now, what is most significant about the way M Moses tells the story is that when he did that and his sister, Miriam, got very upset, along with Aaron, God got angry at them, not him. And how he gets angry is suggestive, at least. So they are upset about the way Moses is using his authority, but the explicit statement goes like this, verse 1 of Numbers 12. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And then what happens? I'll paraphrase. God says to Miriam, you like being light-skinned? I'll make you light-skinned. Verse 10, when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, white as snow. I don't think that's an accident. You want to be white? I'll make you white. God says not a critical word to Moses about this marriage to the Cushite woman. Miriam is bent out of shape about it, and God makes her leprous, white as snow. So a warning, if you are ever inclined to think that the color black is used in the Bible to signify wrong or sin, better think again and do your homework because God just might strike you with white if you like white. He's really serious about these things, isn't he? Of course, there was a huge mercy for Miriam, as there is for us. So here's the summary of those four points. Number one, all races have one ancestor. 
in the image of God, and therefore all of you are wonders created in the image of God, and you never met a person in this room or outside who isn't a wonder, a little statue to God Almighty. Number two, the Bible forbids interracial intermarriage between unbeliever and believer, but not interracial marriage. Number three, our oneness in Christ, in Christ, in union with Him by faith, is profound and transforms racial barriers into blessings. And four, criticizing one interracial marriage in the Bible brought down God's wrath, not on the marriage, but on the critic. So, a little bit of application here to us now. I wonder if you could show me anywhere in the world where interracial marriage is disapproved of between two groups, and those groups nevertheless are full of respect and harmony and equal opportunity. I don't think such a place or such a situation exists on the planet. And you can come tell me afterwards if you think there is. And here's the reason, draw it home, because the specter of interracial marriage demands barrier after barrier to be put up to keep our young people from falling in love with each other. They can't fellowship in the same church, same youth group. They can't go to the same schools. They can't be a part of the same clubs, can't live in the same neighborhoods. And everybody knows what the issue is here. They might marry each other. And wherever that is disapproved of, subtly, deeply, there will be sometimes blatant efforts to separate or a hundred subtle ways to just keep them moving in a certain different direction. So as long as we're disapproving of interracial marriage, we will be pushing away not only our children from each other, but each other from each other because they go, they go together. If you don't make a desirable spouse, or your children don't make a desirable spouse, you don't make a desirable neighbor, or a desirable church member in my church either. This is big, and it's not over. There's a great sad irony here, isn't there? The very situation, the very situation of separation and suspicion and distrust and dislike brought about by the fear of interracial marriage is used then to justify why you shouldn't marry a person of another race. It's a catch-22. Don't, don't, don't marry that person because life will be hard. It'll be hard for you. It'll be hard for the children. They might be called half-breeds or something worse. So, like an army being defeated because there aren't enough troops and nobody will sign up because they're constantly being defeated. That's what we call catch-22. Oppose interracial marriage, and you'll help create a situation of racial disrespect. And because there's a situation of racial disrespect, it probably wouldn't be prudent for you to marry across racial lines. Now, right at this point is where the gospel of Christ becomes massively crucial and important. Jesus died to cover all our sins, and he died to propitiate the wrath of God, which means that we Christians are the freest of all people on the earth. We are free from guilt and we are free from the wrath of God. He is on our side, and we are not driven by fear anymore. Fear is the great field in which the weeds of, of suspicion and disrespect and racism grow. 
So if someone says to you, you know, there's just so much racial prejudice left in the world, I don't think it will be prudent for you to marry her. Your response should be something like, Christ didn't die to make me prudent. He died to make me a, a God-centered, Christ-exalting, justice-advancing, countercultural, risk-taking, courageous, loving person. Will it be harder to be married to a person of another race? Maybe. Maybe not. But since when is that the way a Christian thinks? Life is hard. Life is hard. <laughs> and the more you love, the harder it gets, and marriage is where you love the most, and therefore marriage is one of the hardest places on the planet. I hope I'm not wrecking your dream. It's one of the hardest relationships there is, period, race or no race. Wheaton students ought to be smart about these things and not naive. It's hard to take a child to the mission field. The risks are high. It's hard to take a child to a mixed neighborhood. It might be teased or ridiculed or worse. It's hard to help a child be a Christian in a secular world where their beliefs might be mocked. It's hard to bring children up with some standards. Like, you're not going to wear that in this house, and you're coming in before 1 a.m. It's hard for a dad to do that in this world. Hard. Dads with backbone are rare. I hope you become one, guys, and moms with backbone are rare. Re raising children is hard of any kind, any situation, any race, whatever. Life is hard. The hardest thing in the world sometimes is marriage. It's just right and beautiful and rewarding and pleasing to God, and full of awesome benefits with all the pain. So, few things, I think, are more beautiful, few things are more beautiful than when Christian couple across racial lines overcome every racial prejudice, every ethnic slur, every gospel-contradicting fear, and then display in a marriage the covenant-keeping commitment and love of Christ for His church. That's what marriage is for. Marriage is not mainly for romance. It's not mainly for sex, as good as those are. Marriage is mainly displaying to the world the covenant-keeping love of God between Christ and this church and this church and Christ, Ephesians 5. Dream that dream, and it will profoundly affect whom you marry. Christians are people who move toward need, not comfort. Christians are people who move towards justice, who move towards beauty. They don't move towards security at every point. Life is hard. God is good. Christ is strong to help. So, conclusion. Don't, Wheaton students, don't underestimate the challenges of marriage. Interracial marriage, don't underestimate that. Any marriage, don't underestimate that. But when it comes to interracial marriage, celebrate the beauty of it. Embrace the burden of it. Both of those, the beauty and the burden, will be good for you, good for the church, good for the world, and good for the glory of God. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, I pray now that you would grant students to be discerning. May they test all things biblically and hold fast to what is good. And would you grant them your guidance in life? Decisions are made at this school that are profoundly influential in everything that happens to them for the rest of their lives. And we are so glad that you are wise and sovereign and good in your leading your children. I commend them to your grace, which is able to establish them and give them a place among those who are sanctified by faith in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you're dismissed. <laughs>